Good morning, happy Sabbath, and welcome. Thank you for stopping in. We're getting close to the end of July already. Believe that? We're in the second half of July. So uh, before we get going, I wanted to share, this is weird. Alpaca, it's been shaved. to share it with you guys so in the devotional this week i know i've shared probably this welcome commentary before it it's it cycles through several of them but i like this idea this week with everything going on it said imagine you're sitting on a bench next to god and as you sit together he smiles at you and asks what's on your mind and i when i read that that morning i really did just stop and thought what is on my mind and uh so take a moment what is on your mind and uh it's a great time to share it with god huh? just open up and be in his presence to honor god i like this god when i look at the world around me i'm amazed by what you've created i read that also that morning and i thought Sometimes I get so caught up in everything going on and uh, the drain hole that the earth is spinning around that I forget or get distracted or something. And I don't look at the world around me to see the amazing things God has created. As you know, nothing's caught God by surprise. He knows what's going on. We can trust him. So let's enjoy what he's created. And, uh, and uh, there, that's a pretty picture. I like that. Further on, he talked about my concerns. And here from Lamentations, I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. And I stopped and I thought about that too. The Lord is my inheritance. I don't have to worry about anything on this earth as far as what's going to happen to me or what I have to do. I just have to trust in him. It's also echoes. I will hope in him. You know, the verse from Romans 15, the God of all hope, I will hope in him. And the questions there, what does it mean to place your hope in God? So again, you're sitting on the park bench. God asks, what's on your mind? And then what does it mean to put your trust in God, the creator, the king, your king, my king? Talk to him about what's on your mind right now. In this app, you can actually add a custom prayer or something, and uh, which is a very beautiful, nice thing to do. We continue. Like I said, sometimes I get wrapped up around all the things in this world as it swirls around the drain. But you, God, will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you. All whose thoughts are fixed on you. So, like I've, like I've told myself many, many times, when I'm looking at the problem, when I'm looking at myself, when I'm looking at this, that, or the other, Things look bad. When I stop and put those spiritual eyes on God, when I'm still and know that he is God, peace, peace. When worries start to overwhelm you, overwhelm you imagine lifting up your eyes and seeing Jesus stand over you. Nothing is too hard for him to handle. Do you believe that? Nothing is too hard for him to handle. So I'll give it to him right now. More beautiful pictures. Came across this verse also in, um, in the uh, following devotional. It says, finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Are you worried sometimes? We are rebellious. We're born rebellious. We're built rebellious. We're programmed for rebellion. And 
there's this constant battle, just like Paul writes. I do the things I don't want to do, and the things I want to do, I'm not doing. I feel that way. But this verse was such a great, just relief. God doesn't judge us like we judge each other, like humans judge each other or at human standards. He's God. Finally, it says, when I confessed all my sins, stop trying to hide. He forgave me. All my guilt is gone. See, that's beautiful. And you can rest one day. I know we're not going to be sitting on clouds, but that's an awfully nice looking set of clouds there and that whole thing. That's very nice. Okay, moving on. We've got some pictures of gardens and we've got some people that are going to share with us here. So. My name is Ryan with Verses, a nonprofit that puts scripture to song to help you hide God's word in your heart. If you stick around to the end of Guided Scripture today, you'll hear a song we recorded for this passage that will help you memorize and meditate on it. The verse of the day is 1 Corinthians 13, 5. It says this, Love is not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It's hard not to see our culture and even myself in this passage. We are regularly rude, insisting on our own way, irritable and resentful. And yet, that's not the way of Jesus. Instead of being rude, we are called to honor others and how we treat them in person and online. Instead of insisting on our own way, we are to lay down our lives like Jesus did. Instead of being irritable, we're asking God for patience and for kindness. Instead of being resentful, we're called to forgive and extend grace. Thankfully, we learn from Jesus how to do all of these things. The good news is that we receive this kind of love from him. And when we do, we are fueled in our ability to show it to others. In response, you can ask yourself these questions. How might you be more honoring where you've been rude? Where is Jesus calling you to lay down your preferences? Where are you irritable and need patience? And where might you be resentful and need to forgive? But first, I want to invite you today to be refreshed and reminded of God's perfect love for you in Jesus. And then let's ask Jesus, the one who loves perfectly, for the help and the strength to love like he does. Remember to listen to the song at the end of Guided Scripture, and let's hide God's word in our hearts together today. Wonderful. That was great. And if you're wanting to hear that song, you're going to have to go on the YouTube app and find it, huh? because we're not going to have it here today. <laughs> Sorry. We're closing up our study. Get the veil off the Bible. So let's get going right away. Over the last couple of sessions, we have seen that God's glory can be seen in every corner of Scripture. This glory is the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Jesus and his gospel can be seen all throughout the Bible. When the Holy Spirit frees us to see the glory of Jesus in every story of the Old Testament, we behold the glory of Jesus and become like him more and more. No doubt, when some of Paul's original audience heard this teaching, they thought he must be doing something wrong. They might have thought and said things like, the story of Moses isn't about Jesus, it's about Moses. The glory is in the story as it stands, not in something that it points to. Aren't you just messing around with God's words, Paul? Aren't you tinkering with that which ought not to be tinkered with? Well, <laughs> apparently, Paul anticipated these objections. Listen to what he writes after talking about seeing the glory of Jesus in all of Scripture. Therefore, Having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Paul says that he refuses to tamper with God's word. He is taking the assumed objection head on. When Paul talks about a veil being over your Bible that can only be taken away by the Holy Spirit, showing Christ to us through all of Scripture, he's not tampering with God's Word. He is reading it aright for the first time. He is not, as he says, being disgraceful and underhanded. He is not practicing cunning or trickery. How do we know this, though? 
What proof does Paul give us that he's not tampering with God's word, but is in fact teaching what is correct? Well, he writes this, by the open statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. He is openly stating truth, laying it out for every single person's conscience and saying, doesn't this seem right to you? Doesn't your conscience bear witness to the fact that this is true? Doesn't it ring with genuineness? Paul is challenging us to test it ourselves. Try it out and see if what he said is right or wrong. The second proof is that he is saying all of this openly in the sight of God. Ultimately, Paul is not appealing to what you think is right or wrong, though he does believe you will find it to be true. Paul is mainly concerned with what God thinks is right and wrong. He is teaching all of us in the sight of God. He is performing all his ministry to please one master. Whether you take it or not, Paul has fulfilled his duty to God. Now there are two final notes I want to make about these two verses, and it has to do with the phrase, tamper with God's word, which Paul says he refuses to do. First, the word tamper is unique to the entire New Testament used in the Greek only here. But in other writings of the time, the word has been used to reference the watering down of wine. The image here would be the mingling of truth with falsehood, or the diluting of the real message and punch of scripture. And Paul refuses to practice this. Which leads to an interesting observation. If we do not see Christ in all of scripture, are we diluting the Bible? Are we watering down the wine of scripture when we see morality, rules, stories, and creeds, but not Christ? Are we mingling truth with error when we fail to see that the whole Bible points to Christ? See, Paul refuses to tamper with God's word in such a way, and I'd advise us to all do the same. Secondly, and finally, it is possible that Paul is still referring to the story of Moses' shining face and the veil he used to cover it here in this passage. Isn't it possible that this tampering and deluding of God's presence could be a reference to the veil Moses put over his face? Wasn't that a dilution of God's glory? Well, Paul here is saying that he refuses to put up the veil himself. He refuses to dilute the glory of God. He will boldly and openly proclaim that Jesus' glory in the gospel can be seen all throughout scripture. And I suggest we take his advice. Turn to Christ, invite the Spirit to illuminate your eyes, and read the Bible searching for the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ in every single corner. Hey there, I'm that was wonderful. Let's move on. This is the final part to this series. Well, this is the final session of our study through 2 Corinthians 3 12 to 4 6, and we did not save the easiest part for last. We have learned that there is a veil over our Bibles keeping us from seeing the glory of God. Only by believing in Jesus is the veil removed. It is removed by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us like a new tent of meeting and gives us the freedom to see the glory of God throughout the Bible. As we see the glory of God, we are changed into the glory of God. And then last session we learned that Paul is not tampering with God's word, but is presenting it in its full radiance and glory. Everything points to Jesus. Saying anything less would be to put the veil back. But what about those who pick up the Bible and no matter what, just cannot see anything glorious about it? They don't see Jesus. Sure, they may read the word Jesus and even listen carefully to the stories about him. They may say he is a wonderful teacher or a compassionate person after whom we should model our lives. How can we say that there is all this glory in our Bibles, glory that would change us as we behold it, if people pick it up every day and see nothing but words on a page. Well, Paul has our answer. And I'll warn you, it is not what we want to hear. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 
So why can't people see the glory of Christ? It's because their minds are blinded by Satan. The veil remains, not only over the Bible, but over the whole gospel. They cannot see Jesus because of the veil. This is hard to hear. We want the answer to be, well, it's because they're stubborn or they are just too sinful to see Jesus. But that's not the answer we are given. The answer we are given is they are blind. There is a very real spiritual barrier over the minds of unbelievers. And unless that veil is removed, no amount of faith in Jesus is even possible. No apologetic or act of service or argument or sermon can change their hearts. That is because they are not rejecting you, they are rejecting Jesus himself. This is what Paul writes next. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So if we can't change them, what will? Well, Paul has our answer here as well. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God shone the light of Jesus into our hearts. He gave us knowledge of Jesus. He revealed to us the face of Jesus. God must remove the veil. This brings us full circle back to the question we asked ourselves at the beginning. How is the veil removed? We learned that the veil is removed by turning to Christ. That is how the veil is removed for us as Christians, so we can see the light of gospel in every corner of scripture. But it's also how every single person has the veil removed themselves. They must turn to God. And now this is one of the numerous places throughout scripture where we butt up against the tension between God's sovereignty and man's free will. Can someone turn to God unless God shines the light of the gospel on their hearts? No. God must first do the illuminating. But can someone have the veil removed without turning to God? No, they must turn, they must repent, they must come. You see, we try to build a tension where there is none. God shines his light and we turn, both are true. So how then should we pursue our unbelieving friends? Pray for them. Ask God to shine the light of the gospel in their hearts and minds. Pray that God would remove the veil. Then act. Share the gospel with them. Teach them about Jesus. Love them in the name of Christ. Pray and share. Finally, what does all of this have to say directly to us as Christians? Well, there are two main things I want to end on. First is grace. The reason why you believe in Jesus at all, the reason why you are watching this video, the reason why you can read your Bible and see God's glory in it, is all grace. God shone the light of the gospel onto your heart. You weren't smarter or luckier than everyone else. God was just gracious to you. He moved you. So give him thanks. Rejoice and be glad that you can see and believe Jesus. Thank him every day. Run to scripture and see what so few can, the light of Christ. The second thing has to do with the light of Christ itself. Listen to Paul's words in this final verse of our study. He says, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There is one thing that Moses wanted to see on Mount Sinai, the glory of God in his face, in its fullness. But such a vision would have killed him. So God only allowed him to see the backside of his glory through a little crack in a rock. Now this vision alone was too much for Moses, but there was more. And in Christ, we get that which Moses was refused. We get the face of God. And what is the face of God? It is the person of Jesus. 
the great news of the good news is that one day we will see God's face in Jesus Christ. We will behold the fullness of God's glory when we behold the fullness of the glorified Son of God. Even now, we get to get glimpses of that glory throughout our Bibles as we see the gospel in every corner of Scripture. But each taste of it we get leads us into more and more yearning for that final day when we will see Jesus face to face. So behold him in your Bibles. Become like him in your lives. Be full of expectance for the day when he comes. Thank you for joining us through this study. May God bless you. Amen. Well, hey there. We really enjoyed that study. <clears throat> that was <clears throat> Get the Veil Off Your Bible by Spoken Gospel. That was David Bowden. And I'm just, I just want to go back up to this verse here. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. It seems like this last year, these last few months, last few weeks, this past week, it's getting heavier and heavier. And how can we be at peace, much less perfect peace? And there's only one way. Fixing our thoughts on Jesus. Um, I want to share a video clip here. And we'll talk about two aspects of it. And then we'll be finishing up here pretty soon. So I hope you enjoyed that um, uh, video series by Spoken Gospel. I thought that was fantastic. And now we're going to look at a very familiar story from the Bible as played out here. He is here and is calling for you. Me? Now. He's here. What are you talking about? I do not know. Sister of Lazarus, may Adonai comfort you, together with all the... I guess she's gone to the tomb to weep there. She ought not be alone. <clears throat> What's wrong? The family plot is that way. Yes, but you said people are approaching Bethany from Jordan. Right? This is the Eastern Gate. <laughs> Lord! If you were here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Wow. Um, so the, the two things that struck me as first is you see Mary running to him, just running in agony and crying and screaming. And perhaps we'll all be there if we haven't already been there at one time or another in our lives as things happen. And her question, why, Lord? Why didn't you? And sometimes our questions, why God? Why does this happen? Why don't you answer that? That was one part. But I think what really took over in my thinking was then seeing Jesus breaking down and crying, looking at his disciples, looking at his friends, looking at the bereaved. Being God, coming to save us and so um, i just sat and thought about watch that and thought about that what is it that drives god to crying like that so it's been a tough week praying for the family of mike dang and many other families. And praying that we hold tight to each other as this whole shaking continues. Uh, I'm praying that it shakes my grasp of earthly things away, but strengthens my grasp onto God. And um, so that's what we're gonna be praying. And, uh, and then we'll close out with a beautiful song, okay? Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. I'm praying for the families who are hurting right now. I'm praying for each person who's hurting, who's struggling who's alone, may they feel your presence and have your hope and peace. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him. So that, yes, you can overflow with hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for coming. God has been so good. Thank you all for stopping in. God bless you. Shalom, shalom. We will see you next week.